This is Dr. Clark's Monday night message from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 6 through 18. Now, just by way of the progression of thought, I'd like to suggest for you that primarily in verses 8 down to verse 11, you have the various trials of suffering uh, mentioned for us. And then in verse 12 through verse 15, the glorious triumph uh, of the suffering. And then in verse 16 through 18, a testimony with reference to such a life of trial of suffering. Now, let's look at it in light of that. In verses 8 through 11, the various trials of suffering which are mentioned. <coughs> we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Now, Please observe, in verse 8 and 9, there are mentioned, if you please, certain areas of suffering, certain areas of trial, and then what these particular areas cannot accomplish, even though they are bona fide and true and specific ways of suffering, which is mentioned right here. Now, here you have the matter of uh, troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Now, uh, look at this uh, a little more carefully, shall, uh, shall we together? Troubled where? Troubled on all sides. In other words, there is a complete head about the believer, or a complete head about the one who's going to be a fruit bearer for the Lord Jesus, and uh, it, it's a head all the way around him. And yet, it says, we're not distressed. Now, this particular word, distressed, I, I, I realize that sometimes that we have meanings for words that are a little bit hard to get a hold of. And um, uh, this, I believe, to be one of the words. Now, you know what uh, distressed is. Common uh, understanding really is, but actually, uh, this word distress here looks at something whereby you are uh, placed into a narrow place. Have you ever uh, uh, been in uh, a room with? Uh, no windows, and uh, it seems to be uh, real small, and you've heard the people are having claustrophobia. Well, while I was in the war in the Navy, I visited uh, a very good friend of mine who was uh, uh, on one of the subs over in Pearl Harbor. And he happened to be an officer on this sub, and uh, we were high school chums together, ran rodding around those mountains, and uh, just having lots of fun as kids. And uh, uh, I heard that his sub uh, was in dust, and so I went down, and sure enough, I uh, saw Jack, and. I hollered at him. Well, he, he, he was so surprised to see me over there in Hawaii, there at uh, Pearl Harbor. And uh, yeah, so he came sailing off, and uh, he said, have you ever been inside of a sub? And I said, no, I've never been inside of one. Would you like to go? I said, well, I'd like to go in, but I don't want to stay. And uh, <coughs> he said, well, uh, uh, come on, I'm going to take you inside of this sub. And he took me all the way through the submarine, and he showed me his quarters. Now, believe me, he was an officer, and I guess his quarters were just about that big. Now, I said, how do you stand it? I said, man alive, I don't hardly think I could take this. In other words, they were so confined, the quarters were so confined, that uh, you'd give me claustrophobia, that's all there is to it. Well, that's what we have here. Even though on every side we are troubled. There's trouble everywhere. 
Yet we are not to the place where we feel as though we are totally, completely hemmed in and uh, are having claustrophobia because of trouble. They're there. But have the troubles reached to such a place that they have caused you to lose your real sense of perspective and are not able to think. The Apostle Paul says, I'm troubled up here. But I don't have trouble claustrophobia. The second thing he states here, I'm perplexed. I'm perplexed, but not in despair. Terrible perplexity. Now, what does this mean? Well, as far as the word perplexed, it is a word that uh, brings you to the place where you have many doubts, so many problems that your thinking is not quite right. We are just questioning. We don't understand. We've got to the place that we fully can't fathom all of the difficulties which seem to surround us. And yet it says, even though I cannot understand, even though there's many things that I, I'm doubting, not to question in the Lord, but doubt from the standpoint I don't understand, he said, um, <laughs> not in despair. In other words, I'm not ready to throw the towel. Well, I'm not too sure I can join him right there. <laughs> because I'll guarantee you there are times that I just wish to goodness that someone would offer me $100 a week counting tadpoles out there in the mountains of Colorado, and I'd take them up with a drop of a hat. Ready to talk to Cali. But here it is. The Apostle Paul says, listen, when it comes to the matter of serving the Lord, you can be troubled on every hand. You may enter into the area of not understanding all of the trials which may hem you in. It said persecuted, but not forsaken. The word persecute is pursue or to go after with intent to bring ill upon us. This, this is common for us. Persecuted, troubled, perplexed, but it said we're not forsaken. Underneath are the continuous everlasting eyes. And he's reminded of the promise of the Lord. Lord, I'm with you all, even unto the end of the year. I am there, persecuted yet. Here are the normal activities which one as a believer can expect if they want to live and serve the Lord. And then the last couplet in verse 9 Cast down, but not destroyed. Cast down. And I heard one put it this way once, and I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> knocked down, but not knocked out. Yes, often. Often cast down. Often we will hit a point of defeat. But, not knocked out of here. He'll lift us up. We haven't reached that place where the whole thing was dropped. Not there. And uh, this is not to be the experience of the belief. You see, to have a life of fruitfulness, these four types of suffering are normal. And the Apostle Paul is simply stating them at this point. You remember in Philippians 4, it says there's a price to pay many times in coming to Christ. I've paid the price to come to Christ. And then in verse 10, there's a price in the pathway of Christ that I may know him. The power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. And that's the matter of suffering in general. Now, he enumerates for, for us in 2 Corinthians 4, specifically some of the areas of trial and difficulty in suffering. 
if you're going to be a preacher. Distressed, troubled but not distressed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not cast down. And then she gives us a bit of commentary. And I love this. And uh, these next two verses have not been easy to understand. But let's take them in light of the context. And I'm not too happy with some of the things that I have read by way of uh, tracks. Uh, have you died to self today? Have you put to death the flesh? Now that is not what is meant here. So many times those particular tracts, as good as they may be in some way, they have behind them a definite, pious emphasis of the flesh. And at this point in verse 10, please notice what he's talking about in the context of the suffering of the saints. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Now, he's just told us, hasn't he? There's some things with reference to suffering. Now then, he moves one step further with a commentary, bringing to bear upon the areas of suffering, and stating this literally, always bearing about in the body the putting to death of the Lord Jesus. The putting to death of the Lord Jesus. Where? in the body of the believer. Well, what is the putting of the death of the Lord Jesus? What is it? Well, it's a sacrifice, isn't that right? The total supreme sacrifice. The Lord Jesus Christ is crucified. Now then, I'm told this is a continuous thing that we bear about in our body and that is to be the perpetual putting to death of the Lord Jesus in our body. And we're going to, I think, we'll clear it up in just a little bit. For the purpose in the last part of verse 10, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in the body. You remember Philippians chapter 1 when the Apostle Paul states this, For me to live is Christ. Now, if there's going to be life, and notice the order, and you absolutely, absolutely cannot reverse this order. Do you know not a one of us right tonight would have total, complete forgiveness of sin saved by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ unless there was death first? There had to be the cross before there could be the life. Now then, here in verse 10, you'll see there is the cross before there's the life. And in order for the life of Jesus to be made manifest continually in my body, there's got to be the bearing of the death of Christ's son. Now, I think verse 11 gives us a pretty good commentary on it. Four. You see the explanation? For we which live, we which are continually living, are perpetually delivered unto death for the sake of Jesus Christ. For the purpose that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. What does all of this mean? I think to gives us a good commentary in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans where he states this. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yea, we are killed all the day long. The Apostle Paul, in light of a life of being a fruit bearer for his wonderful Lord, is one that in this flesh he is manifesting the fact that there is to be sacrifice in order to be life. 
and sacrifice of the servant of God so that the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, might live through that servant. Now then, where is there to be the exaltation of the servant? Huh? You tell me. And it isn't a matter of killing your old sin nature, dying to self to be absolutely not. We're going to see the secret of it in verse 18 because it involves a sense of value. And it involves some decisions. But at this particular point, the suffering of the saint revolves around the saint or the servant of God being the servant whereby there's to be the supreme sacrifice in that person so that the supreme life of that person might be manifested. Now then, the triumph of suffering is found in verse 12 through 15. And again, it brings it just a little clearer. So then, here's a conclusion, although it begins this next section. So then, death is continually working in us. But what? Life in you. Now let me ask you a question. To whom are the recipients of this letter? Who are they? are the believers at Corinth. Isn't that right? The believers at Corinth. They're not the unsaved up in Canada. They're not the unsaved of the Alpha. We must reach all of these people for Christ, yes. But he's talking about service that involves suffering among the household of faith, whereby there might be life among the saints because they sacrifice of the service. How do I know this? Hold your hand here and turn with me uh, to uh, First John. First John, verse sixteen, of First John chapter three. First John chapter three. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, what's he talking about? Well, he goes on to explain it in verse 17. Thus, whoso hath this world's good, and seeth, seeth his brother hath need, and shutteth up his heart of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? It is to be the life of sacrifice in order that life might be true for the believer. In other words, being built up. It's the same thing that you have in Second Corinthians chapter 2, where he's talking about, we are uh, the servants of the Lord, to the one we're a savor of death unto death, and to another of life unto life. As we minister the word of God, those who reject the word of the Lord, it just simply is a ministry of greater condemnation and judgment upon them. Those who are the recipients and will accept the message of God, they are those that are being built up, built up, built up in this life which you have from Christ. And the servants of the Lord, those who will minister for the Lord, those who will witness for the Lord, those who will bear the message for the Lord, those who will teach or anything else, they are to be those who will be a servant. For whom? I believe in light of the context, the sacrifice for the saints of God. That we might find 
in each one of us who named the name of Christ in the family of God, we might have those who know what it means to sacrifice. So that in sacrifice there might be life among the saints. And if you want to read the rather interesting article, as I've just been summing through the Good News Broadcasters, a testimony of the lady from Russia, come to the West. I think it's easier to be a Christian in Russia than it is here in the West. Because in the West, there's so much temptation of sin. Whereas in Russia, they'll pay fines of a month's wages just for the fellowship of the saints on Wednesday night. <laughs> Wouldn't it be terrific to have a prayer meeting like that on Wednesday night? If you're going to, if you come to prayer meeting, you're going to get fined a month's wages. Man alive, here in the West, I'm saying we still have some mighty scared churches. Now, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to get off on a hobby horse or anything like that, but here it is, right here in the Bible, that the time of the trial of suffering for the saints like this. What does it do? All right, it's to work what? Death in us. We are not to be the important ones. The servant is not greater than his Lord. No. Death working in us so that life might be working in you. Grant that this would be the case. And then he goes from one step to another. And observe in verse 13. We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. What's he saying? He is saying that as far as the death working in us, it is that sacrifice which is involved in the ministry the witness and the declaration of the message of God. Now, how many of us know what it means to do any sacrifice and just to speak and get the word of God? Hmm? All right. And then, so if it brings us to a further area of sacrifice in verse 14, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. You see, after death there's resurrection. And in resurrection there's what? There's presentation. Why, this last year, what do we have in Montreal? There in Canada. We had the great Olympics. Isn't that right? Oh, my, the millions and millions of dollars spent on the playground. Now, building this and building that, and there was the, there was the great uh, uh, lost of honor where the athletes walked up and received their gold medal, received their silver medal, or received their bronze in itself. And it was the rostrum of honor. Well, what does it say here? That in resurrection, what he's going to raise us all up and present what? Present with you. Present servant and saint together unto himself. Everyone. Just make sure. It's going to be on the rocks in the mountain. And where and why? 
suffer. And then the final crown of it all, the great triumph of it, in verse 15, for all things are for your sake, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many abound to the glory of God. Well, you know, there, as we watch the telecast on uh, many of these presentations, why the crowd just broke into a great applause. Can you just think when we all hear that glorious beckoning voice? Suppose there has been sacrifice to the place where some of us will be laying down our lives with the call of God upon our lives to do his will in the place of his calling. So what? Just think one of these days in light of this verse, it's as though the whole company of God standing upon the rostrum of honor to be presented unto the Lord as well as other places and then till every man has have praise of God the whole throne of heaven breaks forth in a great crescendo of praise and applause for whom? Under the glory of God. And my father gets the glory of the Lord not some puny man. You know it's so naughty today for me to see so many who are trying to rob God of his honor. Now this is terrible. To become known, to become the important one, not so. Oh, one of these days the triumph of the life of suffering for the saint for the servant of God. When the whole household of faith and all of the angelic beings in heaven and everyone break forth in that great crescendo of praise unto the uh, uh, abounding grace of God to think that he would redeem us, to think he would give us the privilege by his grace not only to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus, but by his grace to suffer for his sake, to become a servant and a saint of God, whereby death working in us so that life might be working in us. And I'm of this opinion. To the degree that you'll find in any company a saint, to the degree of sacrifice, whatever that sacrifice may be, to that degree you're going to find the life of the Lord. You know, any old organization can build itself with the wheels of organization. So these, these great marble pillars and all of this, uh, great edifices, why well, they're as dead as a mackerel. that has been caught for a month. Where's the light? I'll tell you the sweetest and most wonderful places to be in. of a little company of saints. Knowing what it is meant to suffer, to experience hard times, to sacrifice, to be loved the Lord. That love It's just love. It's my joyous experience every once in a while to be able to go out west. In Canada, so we'll be going out the last February. And I'm looking forward to going to Strasbourg. You know what's at Strasbourg? At Strasbourg, there's about four family of believers. They gather together in that great cathedral, a little old infant brick farmhouse. And they have me minister the word. And I want to tell you, it's it's just wonderful, the warmth and the preciousness of the fellowship of those saints of God. Why they still left uh, uh, prairie land, uh, their hands are gnarled and calloused, and uh, 
that had lady dress and the one that feeds the chickens and milks the cows and flocks the pigs and all of this business out there. And uh, uh, oh, they're, they're a, a, a hardy stock. A sin and a sin. They love the Lord. Folks, there's got to be reality to this. I don't think our brand of society is helping us too much to have reality. Are you, are you choosing in life the works of your own will to escape a life that God by his grace has ordained that you might have so that you might know the reality of the praise and glory of God? That's a question you're going to have to answer. And it's all going to come out. Notice the testimony in verse 16 to 18. For which cause, in the life of suffering, in the life of sacrifice, abounding for the glory of God because there's life being built up in the saints, for which cause, literally we do not lose heart, but though it cost us our outward man. But though it cost us our very being, yet the inward man is being made new day after day after day. Feel as though the price is too great. Well, we've had the privilege of seeing time, but don't think it is. And I guarantee you, those that don't see that way, they get the question. They do. You see, they haven't lost. Do you lose heart? Man, alive. sometimes I get so low, I can't even reach up to touch bottom. Ever get that way? Oh, yeah. And these passages are so wonderful. They just thank the daylights out of me. Yes, they do. For which cause we do not lose time. Even though our outward frame it deteriorates, the inward, the inward is being removed, is being built up. Now that's the testimony of the personal blessing in the life of suffering. Now then, notice the testimony from passing from time on into the future that is just been mentioned in verse 15. For our what? All the life that we just can't take. The life that's so hard. Boy, I bless your heart. It says for our life. Our featherweight affliction of trial which is but for a flicker of an eye wink. Why, this little moment of a second is producing for us, if we're willing, <coughs> producing for us what? A far more exceeding what? Eternal, not momentarily, eternal gold pan of glory. Not a contract. The present of the three score and ten. Considered as a moment. 
and the trial of affliction, the suffering of a saint, to be the living sacrifice, letting death, the sacrifice that may one may be called upon to make. It's like but that likeness it to take that likeness to produce what yes. the eternal yes. the eternal weight of glory But who is that for? Who are going to be the recipients of that? Who are those that will be involved like this? Those defined in verse 18. While we look. Now, this word look isn't the word blepo, to see with our eyes. This Greek word look is a word that means to look in the sense of having sense of value. We look upon something in light of its value. Appraise it, if you, if you can. While we appraise, not the things which we see temporally, but while we appraise the things that we have to take the faith. Not sure. For the things that are seen are temporal. They're rust, they're dust, and they're dried flour. The things which are seen with our eyes, and the things which we appraise in light of the temple, are momentary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Now this puts it right on the foot, doesn't it? And the shoe is there. And are you and I wearing it? Are our sense of value centered around the temple? Now, before you answer that, you take inventory of your daily life. Is that it? You take inventory as to your path of life. I've had to. And sometimes the things that we see, they come out on the short end of the horn, don't they? A life of materialism, a life of being buried in the world. Instead of being in the world and not of it, we're in the world and part of it. Now, only the person who's going to pay the price, as the Apostle Paul paid. 
I count all things at loss. I consider all things at loss. And I suffer the loss of all things. And I may win Christ. Be found in him not having mine own righteousness. But then that I might know him in my past. fellowship with suffering and as the Lord cried in humanity oh Lord what suffering if it be possible let this cup pass from me <coughs> nevertheless not my will but thy will be done because the Lord giving to us the preciousness of the agony of that suffering in his humanity demonstrated the trial of humanity. And quick as a flash set the two in their proper order. That's the most important even though it was death, was the will of his Father. That thing not seen, but perceived in the heart of greater power than the thing seen. And the saint servants of God who will do that will fit to that relative degree as if it ended the fulfillment of God's lovely grace for unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ not only to believe in him but also to suffer and precious in the suffering you can't lose it works the eternal way to glory even though it may cost the other man you can have to choose you can have to make your decision